everything you need to know about 1984 chapter 1. So the beginning of the story is what is known as the exposition. In short stories, this happens in the first paragraph or two, but in novels, it may span the first few chapters. You can expect to be introduced to the main characters, the setting, which is when and where the story is taking place, and you may discover the conflict of the story, which is the struggle or problem the main character, called the protagonist, is facing. Now, if the story is told from multiple points of view, not just one character, other expositions may occur later in the novel. However, in 1984, the entire story is told from the main character Winston's point of view. The story is told in what is called Third Person Limited. The main character is referred to as Wilson, not I, and we know his thoughts, but our view is limited to his perspective and what he has to say. So the beginning of the chapter spends a good amount of time describing the city environment and structure Winston lives in as it takes place in London, but it's not the London that people would know. It's a London set in the future. We're told it's April, and it's cold, and the clock is striking 13. We'd say it was one in the afternoon, so time is told in military time, even by ordinary people. This is our first clue that something is different. And we get a lot of clues in the first page. Things are dirty and run down. There are giant posters everywhere with a close-up face of someone called Big Brother. And these posters say, Big Brother is watching you. The electricity goes off and on as they're trying to save power for something called Hate Week. The elevator in his building is usually out of order, so Winston has to walk up seven flights and he's out of shape and has a bad varicose ulcer on his leg, so he has to even rest going up seven flights. Inside of his apartment when we get there is something called a telescreen, which is a metal-like plaque. It's like a two-way television that's always on, and he can't turn it off if he wants to. Even the volume can't be turned all the way off. He's light-haired, he's wearing these blue overalls, that's the uniform of something called The Party. From his window, Winston can see more posters of Big Brother and a helicopter from the police patrol that's snooping on people outside. Winston tries to keep his back to the telescreen as much as possible when he's at home because he tells us it can see you and it can pick up anything above a whisper and it really doesn't know how much they're listening in on him. If they're not listening all the time, he doesn't know. London is now in what is called Airstrip 1, which is the third most popular province in what is called Oceania. Winston works in what's called the Ministry of Truth, Although the official uh, language of Oceania, known as Newspeak, is called Minitrue. He can see the building. It's a kilometer, as it's a, a giant white pyramid that kind of dwarfs everything else around it. And on the side are the three party slogans, which are War is Peace, Freedom is Slavery, Ignorance is Strength. We know that all of these contradict and make no sense, but these are oxymorons that we as readers have to figure out how they work in the novel. And by the end, we, we see how they actually do make sense in terms of the party's goals and what they mean by them. You can see that this is kind of confusing to just get plopped into this, this world, and there's a lot of, of things that are unfamiliar. So from his building, Winston, Winston can see all four similar structures that are the four government buildings. The Ministry of Truth handles education, the arts, and news. The Ministry of Love, which is all about law enforcement. The Ministry of Peace, which deals with war. And the Ministry of Plenty, that was involved with the economy. So the titles of the government, even, are contradictions to the reality of the world that Winston lives in. And we'll see this play out more and more. Now, when Winston turns to face the telescreen, he has to make his features kind of give away nothing. He drinks some horrible gin and smokes a cheap cigarette. Uh, his apartment has a small alcove that's out of the view of the telescreen, which is odd for, for any uh, and most apartments. It is here that he takes out a pen and some ink and a blank notebook. The notebook's probably like 50 years old because they don't make stuff like that anymore. He found it in a junk shop that he wasn't supposed to go to because he's an outer party member and they're not allowed to go into these kinds of shops. But many party members break the rule to get certain items like razor blades, which they can't get otherwise. We're told that he's going to start a diary, which isn't illegal since there aren't any laws, but if he caught was caught with this diary, he says he'd be executed or get 25 years of hard labor just for having 
this plain blank book. He bought the pen because it felt like it was the right thing to use for the book, even though at this point in history, for Winston, everything is dictated into a computer. He writes April 4th, 1984, but he admits he doesn't really even know what year it is, even though he's pretty sure he's 39 years old. Then he's kind of stumped with what to write, not knowing who he's writing for, since if it's the future uh, and it's the same, no one's going to listen, and if the future is different, no one's going to understand. So in a panic, he just starts writing, telling of going to the movies that he did the other night. But the film was really disturbing as it's depicting this boat full of refugees that get shot up and bombed, and children's body parts are flying in the air. A lot of people watching are, are laughing and hooting at the movie, but there's this one kind of common woman that's not in the party that puts up a protest about how horrible it is to see this happen in front of kids, and she gets kicked out. Winston stops writing as he's remembered something that happened that morning as he was writing. People in the Ministry of Truth Records Department were bringing in chairs to the main hall in front of the large telescreen for what's called the Two Minutes Hate. One person he notices is a dark-haired woman he sees in the hallway that he can't stand. Around her waist is this red sash, which is the symbol of a, a group called the Anti-Sex League. Although Winston can't stand women in general, something about her makes him uneasy. The other person he notices is a man named O'Brien, wearing black overalls, which signify the inner party members. He's a bulky, thick guy who looks like a fighter. Although Winston has only seen him like a dozen times in a dozen years, he's like totally drawn to him because he seems intelligent and Winston thinks he might, just not might, not be totally committed to the party. So the two minutes hate gets underway through the telescreen with this grinding horrible noise and we're introduced to this person called Emmanuel Goldstein, known as the traitor to the party. Any work against the party is attributed to his teaching. The film has Goldstein bleeding like a sheep against everything about the party. Now, while Goldstein's talking, soldiers from the Eurasian army are marching behind him. All around Winston, people are like screaming and raging against this guy. Winston notes that no matter how much is said about Goldstein about the, by the party, how horrible he is, he always seems to have this influence and it never gets less uh, and people start following him. So supposedly there's this underground network that Winston's interested in called the Brotherhood and there's this book that contains all of Goldstein's theories about the party. So by minute two, because it's two minutes hate, people are really freaking out and jumping up and throwing, sh shouting against the telescreen, even like chucking stuff at Goldstein's face. So even O'Brien is flushed like he's excited, though he's just sitting straight up, and the girl with the dark hair is yelling, swine, 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 over and over. They're going nuts. Winston tells us that he doesn't have to pretend to take part in the two minutes hate, even though he hates it but he just gets caught up in it. He also comments that the hate is not concrete. It's not just against Goldstein. He can direct it against the party, uh, against the young girl, uh, against everybody or anybody. Now he realizes during this that he hates the young girl because he actually wants to sleep with her, uh, but she's young and pretty and she's against sex. So at the end of the exercise, when people are totally worked up, Goldstein disappears and Big Brother's face dominates the screen and he speaks these soothing words, calming words to people. His face is replaced by the party slogans and everyone starts chanting, B, 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 B. So all this, you know, this chant to Winston seems subhuman and kind of freaks him out with its blind devotion. He joins in because he can't stand out. So as it ends... Winston catches O'Brien's eye and thinks they have this connection in that moment and that they're thinking the same thing. Winston has no idea if this is true, but it gives him hope. Coming out of the memory, Winston sees that he wrote down, Down with Big Brother, multiple times. This act panics Winston, but he realizes that whether he wrote in the diary or not, he'd committed what's called thought crime and he'd be caught by the thought police and taken in the middle of the night. If this happens, one is vaporized, meaning that every trace of their existence is erased. Winston writes again about how they'll shoot him, but he doesn't care. While he's sitting there, there's a knock on the door, and Winston assumes that they've come for him already. 
that they know what he's doing. The chapter ends with him heading towards the door, feeling like he's doomed. So what are you supposed to get from this chapter? The chapter in its depiction of Winston's society gives a feeling and sense of helplessness and despair. We see this rigid and oppressive society where one's movements and even thoughts are under constant scrutiny. Every aspect of life is controlled, and it's a miserable life of fear and scarcity. The themes of the party are fairly well established, and it's good to note them now, especially if you have to write a thematic essay of some sort. We see Winston's isolation. He has no real relationships or connections. We see oppression, control, and propaganda through how the party, also called INGSOC, I-N-G-S-O-C, how they try to manipulate and are present in every aspect of life. We see fear and hate and insensitivity being taught, developed and encouraged, whether it's in the films of the government that, that gets put out, the two minutes hate, or the constant monitoring and spying on party members. No one can be trusted, and you have this feeling that you're being hunted or doomed. There is political commentary already occurring in the domination by the government, even in the very buildings that they're housed in and how they overshadow London, and the contrast in the ministry names and their actual functions. It's a frightening and depressing picture that is painted even in the first chapter, and even the thoughts of our main character are disturbing in what he wants to do to the long-haired girl, the dark-haired girl, out of his hate for her. While Winston is the story's protagonist, he's really not a hero. Questions, comments about chapter one? You can ask in the comments section.